Morning, everybody. Sunny Mondays, and welcome to the News Agenda with me, Fleet Street Fox. And today I'm joined by me, Fleet Street Fox. Uh, we're supposed to be joined by the Mirror's political correspondent, Sophie Huskisson, but she is still en route. So rather than hang around and let you all hang around as well and just go late, we're going to start with just me. So this is the People's Pay Per View. So can I please ask you to get into the comments and ask some questions? Please bear in mind that if you don't, this is going to be horrifically difficult for all of us. I really need some interaction this morning because until Sophie gets here, hopefully she'll join us in 10 minutes or so. But until then, please get into the comments. Ask me some questions. Any questions. Those of you listening later on podcasts are just going to have to. Morning, Sam from Vietnam, you cheeky beggar. Sam is our former producer who uh, took a, basically just went off, uh, refused to work here anymore, and he's gone off to Vietnam, is travelling. But it's nice to know you're still watching, Sam, and uh, watching our absolute disasters and cock-ups from afar. I do hope Vietnam's being kind to you. Um, so those of you listening later on podcast, you're just going to have to refuse to do anything until after the public inquiry tells you the bleeding obvious and they need to pull your finger out. So what have we got for you today? Well, speaking of public inquiries... The Mirror has splashed on the publication today of the public inquiry report into the infected blood scandal, which has seen more than 30,000 people given contaminated health products because they were cheaper. And it is now going to cost the government somewhere north of £10 billion. Pounds. Now, more on that in a bit. But first, I want to take us to page 14, where Sophie's got a story in the paper and she can't talk about it and I'm going to have to do it. Um, it's about the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. Uh, who in a move calculated probably to upset the government, is saying that it must end the two-child cap for child benefit. Now, my script here says, Sophie, what's this all about? So I'm going to have to do it. Oh, no, I wish I read the paper now. Um, so this is the two-child two benefit cap, which the moment says you only get child benefit for your first two children. You get about 20 quid a week for the first child and a bit less, about 13 quid a week or something for second child. And after that... There's nothing at all. Um, now, we do have a bit of a clip from former Prime Minister Gordon Brown, who's explaining the issue with this. He was across about this last week. So uh, even though this is a bit sooner than we were going to mention it, because it's going to save me some time while I'm filling air waiting for Sophie. Um, can we please play the clip of Gordon Brown explaining why this two child benefit cap is such a disgrace? You need a root and branch review of universal credit. It, it, it is simply not working. You've got the two-child rule, you've got the bedroom tax, you've got the cap on benefits, you've got the housing benefit limit, you've got the deductions. I mean, half people on universal credit are paying back loans that they had to take out because they didn't get payments for the first five weeks on universal credit. So the DWP, that department, has become the biggest debt collector in the country. Now, these are the kind of things that have got to be looked at. You need a root and branch review to do it. The quicker it starts, the better, because it is urgent that children are kept out of poverty. So what Gordon Brown talking there generally is about welfare reform, but the two child benefit cap, this is something that was brought in under austerity. Now, tell me what you think about this, everybody. Were you affected by it? Have you got more than two children? Has your income had to go down or have your lifestyle had to change in some way because you're not being, uh, having getting benefits for subsequent children? This is the kind of thing where, from one perspective, people say, uh, you know, why should you have to subsidise someone else's lifestyle choices, having extra children that no one really shouldn't have uh, if you don't if you can't afford to pay for them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, problem with that is that you can afford to have extra children and be in a relationship and then that relationship goes south. And then you find yourself maybe the primary carer and not enough money to go around you've only got one income now looking after them and it's just not the same or you can become ill and you can just lose your job all kinds of things can happen where you were once comfortable and able to make those decisions and subsequently 
that the lot with the world has changed you know you've become disabled you've had diagnosed with cancer or something else and it's just far too difficult um now the tories are really fond of saying that justin welby is a bit of a wet lettuce and they don't like it whenever he said things about um the Steve says, thank goodness, because I was going to say, Steve says, Welby's ventures into politics always antagonise the Tories. Oh, dear, how sad. They do. I mean, he talked a lot about um, school dinners, uh, feeding hungry children and so on like that. And every time you can guarantee there's some Tory headbangers that can easily be found. Cause, and I used to have to do this when I worked at the Mail. You just ring up one or two of them and go, have you got a comment on this? And they always have. And they will say that Welby just shouldn't be getting involved in this. This is politics. It is not the job of the church. Um and he's too touchy-feely. He shouldn't be getting involved in politics. He shouldn't be talking about Brexit or child poverty or feeding children or telling governments what to do. But this is a man who literally climbs into a pulpit every week to tell people thou shalt or thou shalt not. This is right in his wheelhouse to say what's right and wrong. Um, now, you can argue that the very fact he's saying it is the, is the political thing here. The fact that he's chosen to do it outside a pulpit and you know, somewhere else is the thing that um, is going to upset the government to some extent. And it's going to be interesting to see how the politicians react to his intervention, because you can guarantee there'll be some Tories who've got a huge, huge problem with this. But I don't know whether your average church going member of the public is really going to mind too much. What do you think, everybody? Please get the questions. Um, do you mind that Justin Welby is saying things like this? Do you think this is the job of Jesus's current local best friend to be talking about uh, things like how you, children live in poverty or otherwise. Do you think this is a case of, you know, suffer the little children to come unto me or that he really has to keep his nose out of it because his stuff is over there on a Sunday in church and it, this is the government's job and he shouldn't be intervening in this. My God, I hope Sophie turns up soon. Um, let us know what you think, because what Welby has said yesterday, and he, says, he told this to the Observer, OK? He didn't sit down and say this in the pulpit. He said it in a, he did say it on a Sunday, but he said it to a Sunday newspaper uh, and said, the two-child limit falls short of our values as a society. It denies the truth that all children are of equal and immeasurable worth and will have an impact on their long-term health, their well-being and educational outcomes. As a meaningful step towards ending poverty, I urge all parties to commit to abolishing the two-child limit. And what one of the things that Gordon Brown was talking about there in that interview, although we didn't have the exact clip of it, was that when you have a two-child benefit cap, it's not just the third child that doesn't get £10 a week. It's the entire family. That doesn't get the extra £10 a week. And when you're already on the breadline, £10 a week makes a difference. Um, you can, you know, easily have a situation where someone is reliant upon certain benefits, uh, which they've had for a while, and then suddenly you take it away. And that whole family, the entire family has been plunged into more poverty. So that the first child who is getting the 20 quid a week benefit or qualifying for it, basically that child benefit has to spread over more children. So if you are poorer, you have to make your benefit go further. Whereas if you are richer, the benefit doesn't have to go as far. You don't have to spend as much of your income, basically. And it's disproportionate. Um, and there's, uh, I think Sophie is here. Hooray. Come in, Sophie. Come in, please. Good Hello. Girl. I'm Hi. so sorry I'm late. Here we're, here, we're here, we're here. And let's right, talk about the Tories and two-child benefit policy and Keir Starmer refusing <laughs> to scratch it. I'm sorry. Rapid stride. Back to a computer. Um, so I've just been talking randomly. We had a little clip of Gordon Brown talking about universal credit and welfare reform and child poverty. Um, mm -hmm. We've had Steve saying that, you know, oh, this is going to antagonise the Tories, but oh dear, what a shame. I was, I was just saying, you know, Welby is seen as a bit of a, a wet lettuce, a bit too touchy-feely and inclined to talk about things which politicians don't like him talking about. How do you think they're going to react to his intervention? Sally Ann there says that I think he should speak for the people. That is literally mm. his job. Yeah, well, well actually, so, Wes Streeting yesterday was out on the Sunday shows and he was asked about this in Justin Welby's intervention. And actually, he welcomed it. He basically, he, he kind of managed to take this journey on attacking the Tories because the Tories have attacked the Archbishop of Canterbury when he has made his interventions, be it on things like the Rwanda policy, the Tories' plan to deport asylum seekers to Rwanda. Um, and Wes Streeting was like, you know, I'm not going to do this, you know, the role of the church 
is one of virtue, you know? The role of the church is one of looking and focusing and trying to find solutions to injustice. And we're treating the Shadow Health Secretary for Labour it's very much like it's not my role to then attack him for doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing. You know, and it's That's quite Labour, a nice relief, isn't it? A politician say it is. you can say what you like, mate. But then again, yeah. it is confirming what West Treating would like him to say, which is uh, exactly. isn't the Tory policy dreadful. I wonder how mm. he'd react if they were saying something about a Labour policy. Well, yeah, exactly. And we may see very different reactions when um, Labour are in government. But for now, I think the, the tricky the tricky thing that they have with the two child benefit policy is it was introduced by George Osborne and then came into effect in 2017. Um, it was introduced by the Tories and Wes Streeting, he very clearly says, you know, when they say, well, are you for this policy? And he says, well, when it was introduced in 2017, I didn't vote for it. Mm. So by definition, I don't want it to be there. You know, I remember asking Jess Phillips this question before as well at a press conference when Keir Starmer first said that Labour wouldn't scrap it last year on the Laura Coonsberg show. And she has said, I get so annoyed being asked about this because it's not our policy, it's a Tory policy. Mm. Obviously, that's one defence that they can take, but ultimately, they're very far ahead in the polls. It's very likely that they could be in government next, uh, well, whenever the election is, at the next election, um, probably later this year. Are they going to scrap it? And they basically said, we can't commit to it um, because we don't know if we're going to have the finances. Mm. In politics, there are always priorities. There are, you know, there's there are there are always priorities. There is always money to put somewhere. Um, often we end up having culture war issues, getting more of a focus in time um, in politics and poverty and hungry children being swept to the side. You know, Lizzie did a paper over Lizzie Buchan, deputy political editor um, at the Mirror, did a story overnight, and it was about kids at school. Um, being so hungry that they're falling asleep, you know, the teachers are saying that they're not focused and there's, she interviewed a head teacher who said it was absolutely heartbreaking. You know, these are the stories that we should be constantly talking about and that we should be screaming at Labour and say, this needs to be top of your list. Where is, they say they've got, they're going to have this big ending child poverty strategy when they, if they get into government and yet their pledge card that they released next week when Sir, when Sir Keir Starmer did his, his big speech in Essex, child poverty, ending child poverty was not on that. So, yeah. And as we just had from uh, one list view there says, well, he's right. Steve says again, isn't it the job of the church to minister to the most vulnerable? I think there's some people who think that the church should minister while being silent, mm. which if you if you have a little look at the New Testament, is very much not what Jesus would do. He's very much not silent on some issues. Jane says, my goddaughter's got three children. She's affected by this rule. In effect, she has to take from the first two to give to her third. This is barbarism. Effective education is required to ensure the Child Act is adhered to. Um, it does mean that, you know, if you were going to, like you say, it's not a priority. It hasn't been on the pledge card, but only the things they think they're definitely going to get are on the pledge card. They don't seem to know if they're going to be able to sort out child poverty like day one because you just don't have the cash it would have to mean billions would be found it would mean that if any future Labour government started overturning Tory policies then the Tories are just going to say the opposite of whatever they said when they sold us the policy which is this one it would they say well you're subsidizing people's irresponsibility and mm. you know, chaotic families and stuff like this so it's politically a bit difficult to sell especially to perhaps mm. the, the home county Daily Mail reading types who find it easier to criticise people who've, you know, who are mm. poor and have larger families. Peter says, I think universal credit and the two-child policy is a type of economic cleansing of the lower classes, not unlike ethnic cleansing. It's perhaps certainly had that impact, although whether anyone's mm. ever been able to quantify it and prove that, I don't know, Peter, but mm. it's very interesting anyway. Um, and I just wonder kind of if Labour can't commit to it, Tories are going to say he shouldn't be saying anything and um, that Welby is just going to say this stuff. What impact is actually, what's going to happen? Is, if, is anything ever going to change on this? Do we have to wait for some kind of economic boom and when the next Labour government's got some money in like five years' time? Well, you know, there's, there's the hope. The economy is improving 
at the moment. You know, it's, it's heading in the right direction. If this is something that can be bumped to the top of Labour's priority list, and it might not be on their six pledges now, mm. but if it can be number seventh and the way that we get things right to the top and right in their faces, I think is by interventions on really high stages, like with Justin Welby, but also from the public, you know, him saying that, making headlines, means that people who may not be on benefits, may have not heard of the child, uh, the two-child benefit limit, suddenly see this news story. They see it somewhere, they see it on social media, and it changes the public consciousness. It makes people aware. And that's why it's so, I think it's so important that people who do have big platforms shout from the rooftops about things that others don't know about. Because mm. it, it takes people who are not in poverty caring about this and being angry about this to also make change happen, you know, we're we're a whole country. We should be caring about um, the people who are in the worst situations in society, even if they're not those ourselves. Um, so yeah, I think there's there's always possibility for change, and I mean, it's it's very difficult, you know, for people who are in this situation to obviously hang on to this. But the the essence of hope is something that. I think when you've got people shouting for change, it, it helps you to to hold on to hope a bit more that, that yeah. one day we will get that change. I think you could probably say that there is a wish to be able to do something about it, but mm. it's not necessarily a priority because there's an awful lot of potholes in just about every public service that need repairing. Yeah. Right. Thank you for that, Sophie. Now, on to the main story of the day. And at 3.30 this afternoon, the Prime Minister is going to stand up on his hind legs in the House of Commons and tell the country what he's going to do about the report published today into the contaminated blood scandal. Now, for those who don't know, this is a horrifying injustice that went on for decades between the 60s and the 80s, in which people who needed help to clot their blood, so haemophiliacs, accident victims, mothers in labour, things like that, they were given clotting agents, uh, blood products, imported cheaply from the US, taken originally uh, in return for a few bucks from well, you know, people who were basically... You could probably describe them as bums on Skid Row, right? Prisoners, people who, who needed a few bucks for a pint of blood and didn't really care. So those products were infected with lots of blood-borne diseases. They were not screened properly. They were the cheapest blood products on the market. They were rife with HIV with um because a lot of people who were giving uh, blood were prisoners or who were um were living on the streets. Um, they were contaminated with the hepatitis C and so on and so forth. Now, there's one quote I want to read quickly before we go into our first question, which is from Jason Evans. So he leads the sort of the Factor 8 campaign. As it's known, Factor 8 was the name of the blood product that was used. Uh, and his dad was infected with HIV as a result of the scandal. And as a result, his mum was sacked from her job. And this is indicative of the of where society was at the time this all started coming out, right? Remember the AIDS and the epidemic in the 80s and the, the horrifying um, fear that we were all given about contracting AIDS. So this is what the owner of the bakery told the local paper when the family complained about it. Mr. Vern Shelton, owner of the bakery and cake shop in Church Street, defended his decision saying there was always the chance that Mrs. Evans could become infected with AIDS in the future. I know at the moment the disease is dormant in her husband, but he could contract it at any time and pass it on to her, he said. He said his staff were understandably worried about the situation and the possibility the disease could be spread by blood if Mrs. Evans accidentally cut herself while washing up. We have food around. I feel this is the wrong sort of place for Mrs. Evans to work. It could have been a real hazard. So there you have someone who is not infected by the blood scandal, but has been affected. She's been fired. She's been ostracised. Her family have suffered the loss of an income and she, her plight has been in the local paper. So the chances of her being able to get a new job when she is, you know, the AIDS wife is going to be significantly less. Um, Steve says that these people deserve apology, compensation, accountability. One should follow another. Um, it's kind of horrifying what happened to so many people. You, there's the affected and the infected, and they're two different people. Sophie, do we know what Sunak's going to say this afternoon? Has there been a kind of pre-briefing to journalists to, to say, well, he's going to accept the report in full and do X, Y, Z? I mean, yes, that's what we're hoping. We're, we're expecting an apology and we're expecting announcements around a proper compensation package over the weekend. Um, there was talk of it being expected to be around £10 billion. As you say, this is people who have been infected, but also affected. Um, 
I mean, you listen to these stories and like the one that you just read, Susie, this, not only were the experiences horrific, but the fact that this has been dragged on for so long, you know, these, you know, more than 30,000 people in the UK were infected with HIV and hepatitis C after having these contaminated blood products in the 1970s to 1990s, you know, between then, we're in 2024 now, mm -hmm. you know, many of these people have passed away, many people have died without justice. Um, this is, as you know, politicians and campaigners and everyone said, this is the worst scandal, health scandal that we've ever seen in the NHS. You know, and there's, uh, when I was listening to some of the campaigners speak over the weekend and they said, do you still have hope? Do you still have hope that when this report comes out that it will finally give the answers because for so long they've expected answers and they've hoped today will be the day, today will be the day and they are constantly let down. And, you know, they, they've said that actually the report's author, Sir Brian Longstaff, has really, really made the effort to keep the victims at the heart of this. And that's what we hope to happen today. We hope that Rishi Sunak, he will make that genuine apology on behalf of governments, you know, governments and governments and governments that have not acted on this scandal. Governments that at the time were aware that there were issues with blood on behalf of doctors, on behalf of nurses, on behalf of all those who are administering these because there was this sense of cover up. There was, you know, and he's taken the effort. This is going to be a huge report. Um, there are journalists who will be looking at the report earlier on before it comes out getting together all the detail um, to make sure that everyone, the public, the victims, the doctors, everyone knows what has happened here. We get the true answers and the truth um, of, yeah, the biggest scandal that we've seen in the health service. Now, this inquiry was set up seven years ago. And if it is a reference, that is four prime ministers, everybody. Um, Sunak himself gave evidence to the inquiry last July about an interim compensation payment that had been ordered by the inquiry chair, but which was delayed on his watch as Chancellor of the Exchequer. Now, he told the inquiry he recognised that while the historic wrong is over, the hurt continues. Um, but he was jeered by those who were watching when he said that the right and proper way to handle compensation was to wait until after the inquiry. Um, now, Mike says, is there a chance the PM could announce any financial compensation will begin early next year, i.e. leave the next government to pick up the bill? Whatever he announces at this stage, Mike, is the next guy's picking up the bill because it's not going to be Sunak. You know, we're now there. We're at the end of this inquiry. The money has to be found. There's some suggestion over last week that that money wasn't going to, there was going to be no payment until something like September. Um, but there is... Because of the delays, because the interim payments that were ordered were not paid, um, there is a bit less money that has to be found, isn't there, Sophie? Because that delay means that more victims have simply died. There is one victim dies every four days. And I think the, I do quickly do the maths on how many that is over seven years. But they simply don't have to pay out as much because they've waited longer. Well, we're hoping that we can emphasize that affected, these affected people, and that there are gonna be mechanisms within the funding packages and the compensation package to compensate families as well to those affected. But yeah, you're right, you're right. Like we said, over this time, thousands of people have died without getting any justice. And we've seen this, we see it across, scandal after scandal. You, we've seen it so much in the news with the post office scandal now, you see it, that this delay, you know, it's this is people's lives that we're talking about. Some people will not get to see the end of justice with this. And especially with the health scandal, we're talking, these people are on, you know, limited time because of the scandal itself. I mean, we're hoping to get details of the compensation package as early as Tuesday, as in Rishi Sunak will announce parts of it today, but those proper broken down details. Um, it's meant to include life-changing sums of money to the worst affected um, victims, um, and with payouts to sibling, children, parents, um, it's supposed to be, as far as we know, subject to a five-week consultation. Um, so there's a hope that that can all get happen quickly. Because, again, as I say, we see this time and again, with bureaucracy and tick boxing and handing from department to department. Um, you know, Department of Health and Social Care, they weigh in, you've got the Treasury, and 
got the independent report and you've got the sign off from the prime minister and all these different sorts of things. Um, I mean, Jeremy Hunt, the chancellor, said that he will rubber stamp any um, compensation package. He's there from the Treasury's point of view to tick it off. We've had Labour say if they do get into to government, that they will continue that, that nothing will change under there, because then you, you also do have that aspect that sometimes things are ticked off and you get a new government come in and that can delay things, but they've said no, that it's going to be a swift process, it's going to all carry on, um, which is great to see that, you know, I think today we'll have one of those unique days where actually the whole House and the House of Commons and MPs from across parties will all be in unity on this issue, as they rightly should be. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we just we can only hope that now, that now for once, after all of these years, that we, we do not have to talk about delay any further. Hmm. Now, uh, on Twitter, Jim says, what with this and the potential post office reparations, Rwanda, railways, water, various Brexity things, the outgoing robber government is doing its best to store up financial problems to sabotage its replacement. But this is something that is just being used as a political tool against a future Labour government. Um, Jagdish says it's not Rishi Sunak's failure, that of many governments over decades. It's got to be said, when he stands up uh, and issues the apology, um, everyone, you know, everyone accepts this scandal happened, that it was wrong. There's no quibbling about it anymore. There was for a long time. Everyone accepts that the cover up happened, that medical records were falsified, which is a criminal offence, that unethical experiments were carried out on victims, that patients weren't informed, people were given hep C, HIV, goodness knows what else, and it's affected their entire families, their partners, their children. Um, people, other people got infected, families suffered. The compensation was always, always nailed on from the start, which is why Sir Brian Langstaff was suggesting interim payments, because yeah. it actually reduces the final bill. You start paying out a bit now, right? You've got less to find at the end, haven't you? Doing instalments almost. Um, the inquiry chair kept ordering these interim payments. and They just didn't materialise. They don't, even now, they don't cover everybody that's affected. Um, and when the prime minister stands up, he's going to read out a statement concocted by the lawyers and the special advisors, and it'll make him sound very magnanimous. And as Jagdish said, wasn't me. It was a historic sin that I'm going to be recognising the suffering and I didn't cause it, but I'm going to make it all better. Rishi's here for it. Dam says, I question if this will be used as an attack on Labour's ability to care for people in the country just in time for the election season. Some of this did happen under Labour governments, but there were more Tory governments because there's always more Tory governments than there are Labour. Um, but this apology that's going to be uttered today you know, when there is a huge institutional scandal like this, when it happens, there's always one clear person to blame. All right. People always say, well, who is it? There's so many governments and so many people. And, you know, a National Health Trust, an NHS Trust here and some in the Department of Health there and a civil service. Who, who can you possibly blame? They all so many people and they all think they've done the right thing. The original sin might be a long time ago. But the person in ultimate charge has the responsibility. And from the day that Sue Douglas in the Mail on Sunday and Caroline Wheeler in the Sunday Times exposed all this, the day the person who is in charge of fixing that is the prime minister of the day, whoever that is, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody who is in charge, and when there are newspapers dropping with scandal and evidence and proof and medical records, when people are talking about going to the police, the prime minister, the person in Downing Street and there's been several in Downing Street since we've got to that place in this scandal, that person has had the responsibility to settle and sort and fix and apologise. And we've had multiple prime ministers who, even knowing about this, have not done so. Jeremy Hunt as an MP a decade ago. No, sorry, that was about the post office. But um, he, they've all had constituents coming to them saying, I've got a problem. And they said, oh, I'll try and fix it as your MP. But then done nothing about it when they're in government. Mm -hmm. Everyone who didn't settle this, and that includes Rishi Sunak, Right, has to bear a proportion of the blame for the death, mm -hmm. the injustice, the failure of the institutions that they actually lead to recognise that the wrong, the moment it was proven years ago, right at the start, not seven years after the inquiry finally reports back, because the inquiry wasn't into whether something had gone wrong. OK, the inquiry was set up because everybody agreed something had gone wrong. There were criminal offences that had been proven. And rather than go to the police, they set up a public inquiry. That was how it came about. So you wait until the end of the public inquiry is not seven years. You know, it's just ridiculous. It's, that's led to the inquiry. It's reporting back. You've had post office. You've had LGBT veterans. They've been dragging their feet and compensation for all of them, this government. 
which is why some people are thinking that it's almost a political strategy. It's got echoes as well of the new blood scandal that affects nuclear veterans whose blood tests and whose medical records seem to be missing from their time at nuclear weapons trials during the Cold War. It's very, very easy for the British state to just throw up a wall and say, wait for the inquiry. But what about all those people who can't wait because they're dying or they're already dead? Um, it's, a, it's a stupid question in a way, Sophie. I know the answer to this. Is Rishi Sunak, in his apology, going to say, hands up, it's partly me? I mean, as you say, I think we know. I the, think we know I, now. I, I think it, we will see the statement very soon. I think it's probably unlikely. But I guess what we hope is that we get that accountability where he says the governments, where he says the state, where he at least... As Prime Minister right now, as you say, Prime Minister of the day, he has that ability to take responsibility and accountability for the state's mistake. And if he can actively say, you know, politicians, the people in this parliament, wherever, whatever year, whoever was here, standing at this dispatch box, standing behind me, in the government side, on the opposite side, wherever, we have failed people. We have failed people. I think we just want that. That accountability is this set, this is one of the biggest parts of justice, you know? Right. I mean, and I've spoken to the victim commissioner a lot of times. She obviously deals with all sorts of all sorts of cases. And you know, there are several different things that victims want. In some cases it might be they want prison, but in all cases they want that sense that the people who have done wrong know that they have and they put up their hands and they take responsibility yeah. and accountability. And Rishi yeah. Sunak, as Prime Minister, as the person in number 10 right now, he has the power to take responsibility for the state. And we hope that we will see him do that today. But it was, that was why he was jeered at the public inquiry. It's because he was saying, I'm not taking responsibility. I'm not paying it right now. You've got to wait until you force me to take responsibility by the filing of public inquiry. And it's worth just pointing out before we move on to the good news that, um, Andy Burnham, as health minister, was one of those who bears a proportion of the blame, if I'm right, uh, which is that he refused to meet contaminated blood victims for quite a long time. And he believed his officials when they said to him that there was no scandal here and nothing had gone wrong. It was only when he was persuaded to sit down and meet them and see that their medical records had been proven that he sort of had his Damascene moment went, oh, my God, what what's happened? And then on his last sort of day as an MP, he stood up and had an adjournment debate. He was told the powers of parliament about... Um, the evidence of crimes being committed against these people and demanded a public inquiry and got it. It was um, it was established as a result of what he was talking about. And when Andy Burnham gave evidence at the public inquiry, he said really clearly, I feel appalling. I, I am partly to blame. I didn't listen. I should have done. This could have been ended sooner. I, I will regret to my dying day that I didn't do it on my watch. And Andy Burnham got a standing ovation. Mm. And you don't get that at public inquiries very often. Right. But the reason that you get jeered at public inquiries is because you're not taking responsibility and saying this is all someone else, but I can't afford to pay it. And the reason you get a standing ovation is when you go, I, it should have it, sh it should have been me. I should have fixed this. Everyone should have fixed it up till now. And we have to take responsibility and accountability and just being honest and open. And mm. that's what gets the round of applause from people. I'm not entirely sure Sunak's going to get that today, but we just have to see later on. Thank you for that, mm. Sophie. Um, right, we do have to move on a bit. We found some good news in the world for you. Here it is. Now, it's very, very easy to be scathing about beauty contests. And last Friday, the new Miss England was crowned. It's all about ladies prancing around in swimsuits, isn't it? Who cares? But this year's winner is called Milla McGee. She is an amazing woman. Um, she's a six foot tall lifeguard, but she was bullied at school about her weight. You can just see in the top left of the page there what she looked like as a as a child, as a teenager. She had incredible body issues. She went from being a 14 stone teenager who wanted to be petite and small because she was being picked on all the time to not only being a statuesque six foot woman, she, she's still a size 16. She still wears XL clothes. But the benefit is that she now feels, finally feels at ease in her body and is able to walk around in a swimsuit and not give a damn about if someone's got something to say about it. Now, it doesn't hurt that she's absolutely beautiful, of course, but, you know, she's not a skinny mini, even today. And her message is really about being at ease with yourself, a way 
from this bullying. And that's what's enabled her to, to be part of this competition and to want to be in the competition last Friday and to prove that, you know, what that 14 year old teenager was very unfairly treated. Sophie, is this proof, do you think, that beauty, even it's easy to say when someone is gorgeous, uh, but <laughs> point out, beauty really is on the inside? Mm, well, I mean, with this, it's an it's an amazing story, especially at a time when young girls on social media, at school, on Snapchat, and whatever, um, are so anxious and so um, yeah, have, having these like body standards and things thrown in their face all the time. To see a, a woman who is proud of whatever body shape she has, mm -hmm. uh, getting literally crowned for it. We need more of this. Women are, are beautiful, all shapes, all sizes, inside out. Um, we're not all stick thin. Um, we, we, you know, women have cellulite. They <laughs> they have this, they have that. You get older, your boobs sag, you get wrinkles. Like, we That's are yes, human. So we are human <laughs> beings. <laughs> um, <laughs> And um, yeah, we're not Barbies. Um, no, exactly. a, great, a great example to young girls that you are beautiful. Yes, I think especially we, at a time now on the catwalks and so on, we're back to uh, people who look like coat hangers, basically. I know, they've um, come back in. Kim Kardashian went all curvy and suddenly it all was like, what? She's now yeah. stick thin. And it's, you know, we can, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. Young girls look up to, all women, they're all beautiful. Yes. They're all coming different Well different done, sizes. Miller, for sort of um, being, not only being completely at ease with yourself, but being able to use your platform to make other people so as well. And I don't doubt helping some other overweight teenagers if they see the coverage. Thank you very much, Sophie, for taking us all through all this. Thank you for rushing back to your computer and uh, sorting it out. And um, thank you, everyone, for taking part and for your questions. Thank you particularly to Steve, actually, because you asked a lot today and you really saved me. So thank you very much. Uh, we, If you're listening on podcast, please leave us a review. We will see you all again on Wednesday for another edition of the News Agenda. Till then, everybody. Tassie, bye. <laughs>